In this week's episode of BSD Now, we're actually enjoying the holidays a little bit, so we have something from the shelf picked down, and uh, we sat down at BSD Can 2018, way back when, uh, to interview Kirk McCusick about various topics ranging about the early years of BSD Unix, the continuing work of UFS that he's working on, and the governance of FreeBSD and more. So you'll definitely enjoy this week's episode of BSD Now. So here's the interview that we recorded at BSD Can this year in a very small room, but the audio was good enough. So uh, this is uh, our interview with Kirk McCusick and enjoy. Yeah, uh, we covered quite a range of topics on this, including how Kirk first got started with BSD uh, and, you know, how he obviously didn't uh, <laughs> see BSD doing what it did over the 30 years since that time, uh, how the code originally grew and the community grew and we had patches coming in from other uh, universities and stuff and being uh, incorporated back into kind of the birth of open source and how that worked about uh, the leadership of the project and how it's had different generations and survived that change. Unlike some projects that when they have a change of leadership, they're never the same again. Um, also talked about UFS, the file system and how that changed over the years, including uh, a fun story about, grabbing a disk image from a disk from 1982 and reading it this year and uh, watching it work. And now that your software is just as good as it was then. <laughs> uh, talked about conferences and traveling and meeting people and mentorship and all the other bits that are important to open source. And we even talked a bit about the rise and fall of Linux and uh, how FreeBSD is on path to its resurgence. Yeah, it's a wide range of topic and uh, definitely something that will uh, fill some time in case you haven't watched it yet. And uh, yeah, enjoy. We're joined today by Kirk McCusick, who is uh, basically one of the founders of the FreeBSD project and the BSD project at the University of uh, California at Berkeley. So welcome. We're doing this a little bit ahead. So at, during BSD Camp, we were able to sneak out and uh, do this kind of interview. So what we want to know first is, uh, of course, we talk to everyone and ask them, how did you get involved with Unix and BSD? But I guess in your case, this is kind of... Uh, a long story. I was there when it was created. Well, I was going to say, I was office mates with Bill Joy, and it was Bill Joy's project originally. So, you know, it was impossible not to be involved mm -hmm. because there were you know, four desks and four people. And it, actually, it was kind of funny. There was one phone which was sort of for everybody to use. And if the phone would ring, if I happened to be near it, I wouldn't. I just pick it up and I'd hand it to Bill because it's for you. Ninety-nine percent of the time, it was for Bill. So you know, why even bother, you know, answering it if you're anyone else? Yeah. So, but uh, during your early involvement with the BSD, so um, did you have any idea that it would become what it is today? Not a clue. I mean, I'm terrible about predicting the future anyway. But to me, it, you know, it just was this thing where, well, Bill had some programs and. You know, uh, you couldn't be around Bill without getting sort of sucked into doing things. And he'd say, oh, well, you know, could you just do this one little thing? And, uh, you know, uh, the, so we had the, the Pascal compiler, and it would, it's actually, an, it would compile bytecodes, and then there was a little interpreter that would interpret them, and that had been written in assembly language. And so we got the VAX, and Bill said, well, could you just port this over to the VAX? See, you know, the VAX instructions, you know, there's the move on the PDP-11, and there's the move instruction on the VAX. You know, it'll just be simple transformation. Ha, ha, ha. Weekend project, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and three weeks later, something sort of popped out. And, but he, he just made everything sound like it was going to be so simple and so easy, and we would just do it. And, you know, the distribution was just him, you know, passing out tapes, and uh, he was... He was more of a marketer, actually, than, than he was a programmer, it seemed like, because he would go to conferences and talk it up, and people would get all excited and would get these things, and stuff would be coming back. And, uh, you know, it, it just sort of bubbled up and bubbled up and bubbled up. And, you know, at the time, it was like it was an editor. You know, I mean, lots of people wrote programs and passed them around so that it would become 
what it became. No chance I would have guessed that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that motivated other people to contribute because they had no other chance of escaping that during his uh, Yeah, well, marketing. the thing is that Bill would go out and he would talk about people, you know, what are you doing, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, the, the early EX editor was actually came from, you know, the, what was it, EM or something editor that someone else had done. And, and Bill's attitude was always, you know, why come up with something good when you can steal something better? So he would find something else that someone else had done and then just embellish it to, you know, be whatever he wanted it to be. And uh, it was actually not Bill, but uh, Keith Bostick who came up with, you know, he would say, there's no end to the good that you can do in the world by giving credit to other people. And in particular, when we were trying to rewrite the AT&T programs, he would get other people to write CAT or LS or whatever it was and contribute it to Berkeley and he'd put their name all over it and nine times out of ten would rewrite 80% of what was in there. <laughs> okay. But, but yeah, that's uh, a big part of the, the BSD philosophy is, is that the credit is the important thing. Right. Yeah. You know, and you know, by as he put it, one point, you know, where AT and T was bickering over, you know, whether this was the original or not, he said, "I always have someone else to blame." <laughs> well, you need, you need to go talk to so and so because yeah, they wrote it's cat. Not my thing. <laughs> Yeah, or, uh, in a talk I saw earlier this year at FuzzDem, uh, they were doing git blame on one of the files going all the way back to very early on, and just the mix of names from just even one screen full of, of the lines in one file, uh, and just looking at the years of some of the commits. Yeah. It was like, uh, I know that person, and that person wasn't alive when this file was created, but they <laughs> contributed to it since then. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, yeah, there's a, a lot of, of history and you know, the, the copyright notice on the top only tells part of the story. Correct. Uh, when you look at the number of people that have touched a file, it's just like, wow. Yeah, yeah some of them are, you know, it's truly amazing. Mm -hmm. There's uh, you know, some file that, you know, I sort of had thought I had written that program, and when I went and looked, I think I found like four or five lines that were ones I'd put in, and it was probably as part of the copyright message. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it's also the, the care and the maintenance that people put into these programs, and you know, pass it on and make it still work on like newer hardware or yeah, with, with newer environments or newer file formats or whatever it is. You know, entire architectures like Risk Five is brand new, but it's, it's going to run all this old code with only a little bit of help. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it's it's the uh, care and feeding is such a huge amount of what it is that keeps a system viable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's oftentimes very much not the strong point of a, a community-driven project where people want to work on what's fun, not right. what's yeah. new, what's yeah. exciting, yeah. Only the new stuff or, is... or what scratches my itch, which is, I imagine, part of the reason why these architectures get the work they do is if somebody <laughs> has, it's like, I want to do risk fun. Exactly, yeah, and, and documentation is another yes. place where, mm -hmm. uh, I remember now, many, many years ago, someone came up and said, you know, oh, I'm interested in being about this pre pre-BSD in, in BSD and, uh, you know, but, you know, I, you know, I'm just, you know, a, a person that writes documentation. You know, I can't write any code. Is there anything I can do? And I said, well, it's chance for that. We had these manual pages. We've been waiting for work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, actually, is... we have more need of you than of anybody else. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I think part of the thing that made FreeBSD successful, part of it is the documentation, and the thing that made the documentation successful is that we make, we, we don't have this whole hierarchy, oh, you know, you're a kernel person, so you're above the, you know, the yeah, 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 there's all these, and you're above the, yeah. you know, you're a committer, you get just as much rate to vote for core, whether you're committing to doc, or whether you're committing to mm -hmm. Source or ports or whatever, or even to be on core. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not <laughs> yeah, only okay. source committers that are eligible to to stand in the election. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, a, that's and a and, and and furthermore, you know, we, even if we said anyone could stand for election, but if the effect was that only source people ever got elected, right? You know, but we don't. You know, and in fact, it was a few cores ago where someone who was considered marketing got elected. I'm like, all right, we, we finally made. <laughs> You know, yeah. people realize that it's more than just code that's important here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's also the, the tendency that people got 
the appreciation for the work that they're doing that they're doing even more work. So yeah. dark committers become ports committers or source committers and do both bits. And That's how they suck me in. Yeah. I, I wrote some notes on the train ride here in 2013. And then in 2014, I was a doc committer. In 2015, I was a source committer. And in 2016, I was on the core team. Yeah, exactly. And, and especially at this conference, we identified new people with like, hmm, that guy could be a perfect new yeah. source committer. Or mm -hmm. let's just give him a bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that I think gives free BSD or BSDs a, a leg up over the Linux world is that we do understand you've got to keep bringing in new blood. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the yeah. Linux is aging out on, the, on the, the people at the top of the tree, and it's going to be very interesting to see how mm -hmm. that carries over. I mean, when Linus Torvalds either retires or croaks, you know, who's going to step up to that? How's that going to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as the system grows, there's more code to maintain, and that's just too much for a single person or just a small group to do, and yeah. And there's also people leaving, of course. There's life is happening to every one of us. But as we, as long as we bring in more people that are leaving, then the project is still healthy. Yeah, well, I mean, there was a period in BSD where you know if I went on vacation for two weeks, things couldn't get fixed. Mm. And you know, my goal was you know if I get hit by a bus, you know, the thing is going to keep going. Yeah, the project is still and, alive. You know, I'm way past the point where you know I'm a critical cog in the field. <laughs> Uh, so I guess that kind of even leads into our next question is, what do you think is the, the biggest accomplishment of the, the FreeBSD project over the last 25 years? I, well, that's my governance talk, right? I think mm -hmm. that we have evolved a system which allows it to continue moving forward, bringing in new people and letting those people rise. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there was a, uh, a study that was done quite a few years ago now, and it was between uh, actually people in sociology, I think, and at MIT and at uh, one of the universities in southern France. Uh, and they just studied source code commit logs to sort of see who's in charge, you know, mm -hmm. it, for some definition of, of in charge. And if you look at Linux, for example, it's been Linus Torvalds and his lieutenants, which have a fairly static set throughout the lifetime of that. So they, they've had one leadership. Um, most open source projects go dark, which is to say no commits for more than a year, uh, within about five years. Usually when whoever starts it goes away. Uh, occasionally they sort of do one rollover, but then it usually keels over. and. Uh, only a couple projects, Apache and FreeBSD and there's one other, have had three or more successful changes in leadership. And we're, I think we're on our fifth if you count BSD at Berkeley as one of them, so mm -hmm. sort of four in FreeBSD. Or, or ten if you count core teams in FreeBSD. Yeah, but you, you tend team. to have sort of a, I mean, they look at the people that make up the core team. Right, I guess, yeah. You know, there, there was sort of the Jordan Hubbard uh, era, uh, yeah, <laughs> that era. There was the sort of Robert Watson era. There was the sort of the current set of people era. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember exactly how they did right. it, fit it out, but you know there have been people that have moved in and, and you know many of them are still sort of kicking around, but aren't really leading right at this point. But just the ability of the project to survive the kind of the change of leadership, right, and and to continue on after that yeah. successfully, and. Uh, so, you know, what's the biggest accomplishment? I think the ability to continue to evolve and, you know, the fact that our average and median age is still 40 after 25 years. I mean, it, it has crept up. It started at around the low, low 30s and it's now high 30s. I think it's actually 40 now. But, you know, considering if this, this problem is this long tail, you know, I actually chop off everyone that's a committer that's over 60, I think we dropped around 38 is our <laughs> average and median <laughs> statistics wise. Uh, so we just need to get rid of us old geezers. Uh, <laughs> it's only like 12 of us, you know, like we just slew it so badly. Um, but biggest accomplishments in terms of technical accomplishments, I would say the uh, going to SMP from an MP system. Uh, that was we're very good at sort of things that can be done incrementally by a small set of people, but that was something that required a 
huge amount of effort by a large number of people, and it really was kind of a flag day. I mean, it's like we're going from here and we're going to there. Mm -hmm. And you know, that was the four to five transition. That was horrendously painful, mm -hmm. but we got everyone on the same page. Oh, well, a few people had to leave the project, but. Right. I guess it's also a, a test of, you know, the durability of a project, like doing this kind of change. It's kind of radical. And I guess they, they lost a couple of people or the, the trust of some people that this is going to be a viable thing in the future. But then when it's there, new people come and see that it's working and, you know, continue from, uh, from that point on. Right. I mean, one of the other things that I'm not sure I would call it an accomplishment per se, but uh, we have a more studied advancement. So <laughs> Linux Foundation is very proud of the fact that they've added a million lines of code to the Linux kernel in the space of a year or some, some short period like that. And to me, that that's an unmitigated disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, more is not better. I mean, yeah. like, you know, Windows learned this when they, they went to whatever it was where they had 50 million lines of code and they couldn't stabilize it. They right. just couldn't. Like too many moving parts. Just yeah. too much bulk. Right. And and you know, fixing bug. You, you you with that many lines of code, you just can't you never get the bugs fixed to the point where it becomes stable. Um, and you know, they're uh, they have, the Linux, just the kernel is twenty million lines. The entire FreeBSD distribution today is sixteen and a half or something million mm -hmm. lines, but that's like the kernel and you know everything yeah. in the base system. And the utilities, the libraries, yeah. And yeah. so, uh, you know, they they are not at fifty yet, and it's somewhere in the forty fifty. You may probably with tools today you can get past that. But my point is that you know we have exponential growth. So we've got a little longer before we get to that. But yeah. you know, they, I think that's going to be their. Waterloo if they're not careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what is your uh, biggest surprise about what the project has become 25 years later? That it's still here and wildly successful. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, given that the half-life is five years, we've made it through five of those. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you count BSD in total, I mean, we're coming, well, it's 78 to now, so 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I gave a talk actually at uh, the FAST conference, uh, Usenix's final mm -hmm. storage technology. Uh, I get, they asked me to give the keynote, and the keynote was on the evolution of the FAST file system over 30 yeah. years. And, you know, software is even shorter, you know, half life than you know, projects. projects have. You know? yeah. So, three, three to five years is sort of most things sort of survive that kind of time period. So to still have this fast file system running, and in fact, just as a lark, I, I took a, a disk image from 1982, which I just saved it for an image of the very first one I ever did. And I could actually read and write that on the current FFS. Oh, yeah. um, it got a little bit cranky about some of the cylinder table mappings. To, uh, yeah, there were some changes there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it worked. Uh, so anyway, I get up and I started by saying, you know, if you had told me 30 years ago that I was going to be giving a keynote about this software yeah. 30 years later, I would have wondered what, you know, what version of ACID you would have <laughs> <laughs> Or just anybody who would still be using that file system yeah. 30 years on, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, another one of the, the, the sort of interesting questions is, you know, well, is ZFS going to replace UFS? And the answer is no, obviously, because they each solve certain problems. ZFS, when you've got a lot of resources and huge file systems, just, I mean, it's just no-brainer. That's what you're going to use. But in an embedded system, you're just not going to use ZFS. You don't have the resources to, to make use of it. And so you need something that's lean and mean. And yeah, and we're heading into an era. We're going to have billions more of these tiny devices, and they're all going to need a file system. Yeah. And it's not going to be CFS. Yeah. yeah, and I'm sure you didn't expect to ever the fact that there'd be a billion installs of UFS or a, a billion volumes. Right. No, That's no, just I'm, not something you know. I don't think we anybody thought there'd be a billion computers. Back then, yeah. right? And okay. you want to use something that's reliable and has been tested for so long, and not just use a fresh development. Of course, they always happen. But if you have something available like UFS that's been tried and tested, 
it's like a no-brainer to use well, it to just it, get something off the ground. It's not like UFS is stagnant either, right? Yeah. It, it's uh, got trim support and works well on modern SSDs, and it's yeah. Uh, you know, it, it needs care and feeding. You know, I, when I first started at Berkeley, you know, I didn't understand that concept. So, you know, did UFS, and then right now UFS is done. And so I went over and started working on the, the VM next. system, yeah. and then the VM system was done. And so then I started doing stuff with NFS, and now NFS is done. And then all of a sudden it's like, but this needs to be done, and that needs to be done. And, uh, 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 you know, <laughs> have to go like, back, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, you know, thankfully Rick Macklin, well, he did a lot of the, the, the initial work anyway on NFS, and he more or less has been carrying feeding for it ever since. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alan Cox, well, David Greenman originally, and then later Alan Cox has, you know, taken the VM system to places where it never would have guessed in a million years it would go. Uh, you know, and even uh, Jeff Robertson is, taking, you know, does a lot of the UFS stuff these days. So I can just sort of sit back and say, oh, you want to try doing this? Right? Yeah. <laughs> you should try doing this. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so here we go. History repeats itself. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. You know, the, being the grand old man, it can be kind of fun. <laughs> You can have all the ideas and not have to do any other work. Yeah, you yes. can steer it a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> you get to watch the the project happen and, and get all the joy out of it without yeah, enjoying the, the fruits of the, yeah, the labor. The stress. Yeah, you know, someone asked me, "Oh, when am I going to run for core?" It's like, <laughs> no, never. <laughs> I did that for ten years. I've served my time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I guess looking back, what is your favorite previous you related memory? Ooh, favorite three SD related memory. Um, I mean, there's so many mm -hmm. different yeah, things that I can think of. You know, seeing seeing things like the SMP finally shipping, well, not just ship, but finally get made to work in six after five. Um, the uh, I guess, I mean, I have really, I mean, most of my memories are things like conferences, you know, like mm -hmm. where, you know, BSD CAN, which kind of started out as an ad hoc thing and has, you know, to now go to it and just, it's like, wow, you know, I get to see all my friends, and yeah. this, this, breaks record yeah. after record in visitors. And Basically each, every right. conference ever. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, but also things like Euro BSD, mm -hmm. I mean, that sort of you know, started as the, EUG and then later sort of bifurcated into several groups, which, but ultimately uh, became the, the BSD conferences. And the fact that they came up with a model where they could really move around. Mm -hmm. I mean, Asia started out moving around, but the problem was everyone had to bootstrap from scratch, and you right. know, mm -hmm. so you'd get conferences that didn't work because they didn't really sort of know what they were doing. And so Europe basically got this sort of core group that manages like the here's the, the checklist of what you need to do. You, know, yeah. you need yeah. to find a hotel. You need to have benefits da, 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 da. and deals with a lot of the money issues and other things which, you know, volunteers either can't do or yeah, don't realize just, they it's need too to, risky do. to do. Yeah, you just signed a contract whereby you know they're gonna take your house if this doesn't work out. You know, mm -hmm. they just you know yeah. they don't luckily they don't think it through because they wouldn't do it if they knew what they were doing. <laughs> You know, but now that they, there's a, some an organization that backs that, so mm -hmm. that has allowed it to move around Europe, and I, and that has been much more beneficial than I think people realize. Um, you know, when it's always in the same place all the time, then you don't get the local draw. So, for example, mm -hmm. yeah. in Tokyo, you know, I can really only teach my class about once every four or five years because you know you have to build up to having enough people coming, whereas. Mm -hmm. In Europe, I can pretty reliably just teach it year after year after year yeah. after year because we're in a different country. There's a whole bunch of new local people. They want to take it, uh, and that works. Yeah. Plus, you get to visit all the different countries. You get to, yeah. yeah. There's, I mean, there's countries that I you know I've never visited before, and you know, probably never would have, but for the fact that the conference is there, mm -hmm. and you know, plus you get that local draw, and so you get a bunch of people coming in that learn about... Yeah, my BSD. very first BSD conference was the Euro BSD con in my country. I was like, I cannot miss this. And it's local, right? Right. And here I am. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you look at, you know, we had it in Paris last, you know, oh, yeah. a huge number of people 
for whatever reason, the French don't go, you know, oh, I, I can't drive, you know, an hour across the border into Germany. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah. too scary, you know. Yeah. If it's in Paris, oh, well, I'll travel all the way yeah, from yeah. Nice to Paris. Whatever it takes. <laughs> yeah. So, it, uh, you know, I, I, that's another one of the things that, you know, favorites is the fact that, you know, get to visit these countries, get to meet these people that are so excited to have this thing, you know, mm -hmm. oh, I've been using BSD for years, and, you know, and finally I'm at a conference. Yeah, where I can see the faces behind all the commit emails or the, yeah, yeah. yeah. emails and, yeah. and yeah. IRC Who does what? and so on. Yeah, yeah that is the, certainly a factor, yeah, the, the community building, the, uh, the meeting people again. And, you know, when you interact with somebody, you have certain like a mental image of what you expect them to look like. Yeah. And I remember one where there was this, you know, one particular woman that I've been working with, and I just had her in my head as, you know, sort of a middle-aged, dumpy woman or whatever. And so she was working the registration desk, and I walk in and, you know, you know I'm Kirk McCusick, and she goes, oh, you're Kirk McCusick, you know. I'm Joan Apodaca. I'm like, your I mean, she was this young, very attractive woman. I'm like, Whoa, you didn't fit my image at all. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's the interesting thing. And, too. and also just uh, after that, now every time you get an email from them, you read it in their voice. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it can make a very big difference in the, the communication between you because suddenly the any ambiguity is, is slanted in a good way. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's not just text anymore. It's, it, does, yeah. it doesn't you're less likely to interpret the email as hostile because, you know, when you read it in their voice, it's, it's someone you know now, not just right. someone on the internet. Yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, some of those are the things that, you know, are, mm -hmm. you know it's not really a pre-BSD related memory, but it's, you know, it's in the context of pre-BSD. Yeah. Uh, the community yeah, it, is it, it, it's the, yeah, the what makes interacting doing. With, with people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you touched on it a little bit before with the SMP work, but do you have a favorite milestone with the project? Or, well, I mean, you know, milestones that were interesting to me were things like you know getting soft updates mm -hmm. into the system, and yeah. you know, I mean, it's it's some of the technical things that I've been directly involved with or indirectly involved with, probably uh, that are most memorable to me, but it's mostly because I've been. Yeah, directly involved in working on. Oh, well, you like I know sixty four. That went on for quite a while before you managed yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> that yeah, classic one of you know. But that you know really it was that that one finally came about because, you know, I found the person who was the most obstreperous and, and basically collared them into being involved in it. Once mm -hmm. they were involved in it, they stopped being obstreperous and they got it done. Got so it. <laughs> um, that's. I guess part of, it, of the thing that's sort of so interesting is it gets back to the interpersonal things, mm -hmm. you know, where you basically, you know, sort of get to know somebody and, and sort of figure out, you know, how you can, how they can be most effective. Yes, or how you, yeah, how you can uh, make the message make sense from their point of view. Whatever. Right, or sometimes it's convincing other people that their point of view is correct. Mm -hmm. they, they may not be the best at, at getting that view out there. Right. Um, and I mean, one of the things that you know, by being the quote grand old man, is that you know whatever I say must be correct. You know, even if it's complete bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, so I try not to do stuff that's complete bullshit, obviously. But I will often find people that you know haven't been in the community long enough. And are having trouble getting their ideas out, yeah. and mm -hmm. just give give it a push. Yeah, the yeah, idea push, not push that. Push. Let, lend a, a bit of weight to the argument or whatever. Right, and you know when I say, you know, you should really listen to what Alan is saying, and he has some good ideas here, and you know, really doing it like this is the right way to go, and people go, oh, yeah, I yeah. guess I hadn't really thought about that, you know, and then they'll come and engage you mm -hmm. or whoever, and you know. Once engaged, you you're very good at expressing why your idea yeah. is good, and, and you know, it, and then it gets launched. Yeah. Um, so to me, a lot of when I'm just walking around these conferences and I'm talking to people and I hear like good ideas, I you know I make sort of mental notes that I need to sort of yeah. engage with them and, together. and perhaps get them a little more connected into the community. I mean, especially people that are not committers. Yeah. Um, you know, 
uh, there's, there's one person who sent me something about a bug report that was like six years old, and you know, no one had really paid any attention to it, and I just you know, I went into the source code control logs and saw who was involved in it, and I just, you know, I mean, he had put it in there, he had a you know, patch that worked, and he kept updating it, you know, for the new systems, and I said, look, you know, really, this let it go in, and they were like, oh, huh. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I guess it should, you know, and and, yeah. and it did, and it mm -hmm. went in, and yeah, and many they got it into head, and then you know that, but it wasn't, you know, eleven, and I said, you know, why don't you MFC us? Oh well, you know, it hasn't been three weeks yet. And like, look, you know, slush is in a week. Mm -hmm. This has been in here a week. It's been in testing on this guy's machine for six years. Yeah. <laughs> so it got pushed into yeah. eleven. You know, That's so it's little life. things like that, where you know. Yeah. You know, one email from me makes something good happen, and yep. you know, so I like to take advantage of that. But also, you know, in some sense, that's what I'm contributing to the project these mm -hmm. days, much more than I'm doing code or anything else. Right. So we touched on the uh, the project itself and the community, and also the core team that's been elected by the community. So, but there's also the FreeBSD Foundation that you are involved with as treasurer for a while. So, yeah. is that also? Uh, a contributing factor to the health of the project in certain ways? Undoubtedly it is. I mean, it, again, look at sort of, you know, the history of how this thing starts. So it started, I mean, the first distributions were done by one of Creek CD-ROM, mm -hmm. and they paid the initial developers, mm -hmm. to, you know, so they could do it as a full-time thing. And, you know, that was, I mean, it was a huge step up, uh, but, it, that wasn't a sustaining model because we needed, you know, a lot, lot more infrastructure and, and network connectivity. Mm -hmm. And again, sort of fortuitously, we fell into Yahoo, mm -hmm. who, you know, they were using it for everything. So, and they had all the machines and so on, and so they provided our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And you know, that, that that went on for more than a decade. And but technically, it's still going on. It's still going on to some extent, sure. and but the thing was that, you know, what happens if Yahoo son, you know, one day decides to switch to Linux, uh, which they're doing, mm -hmm. you know, or get and, bought or whatever, or get bought or you know, whatever, and you know, suddenly our infrastructure disappears out from underneath us, and so, you know, Justin Gibbs sort of saw this as an issue and said, well, you know, we really should have some way of funding with at least the basic infrastructure that we need, and mm -hmm. started. The FreeBSD Foundation, and it took it was at least five or eight years before there was you know enough income to even contemplate even basic stuff like infrastructure. And in fact, really, we've only converted over to that in the last what, four or five years, maybe. I mean, it's been a slow process, but you know, if Yahoo went away today, you know, we'd be fine. Yeah, yeah um, we're actually having a fire drill for that right now because. They're having a like an eight-hour outage at their data center on Monday. Power oh, work <laughs> <laughs> to work on the power system or something. Yeah. Uh, so we're literally having a fire drill for that. Yeah, and then, you know, there's there's many ways that projects can get infrastructure. Things like GitHub didn't, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a project, they'll do it and they'll provide governance and all kinds of other things. But uh, or the Apache Foundation, uh, and you know, we set up our own, and so that that. By having that foundation and not being under Apache, for example, we have a lot more control over how things work. Mm -hmm. That can be both good and bad. I mean, we go off the rails. Mm -hmm. You know, the Apache Foundation has sort of is a bigger base. It's more stable. Mm -hmm. But yep. uh, you know, and I still worry about the fact that a huge amount of our income is a small number of, of contributions, many of which are one timers. Yep. Uh, but uh, you know, we've now gone for. The four, five years that I've been involved in it without any disasters in that area. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the foundation is, is an important keystone. Uh, I think the biggest fear of the project uh, is that somehow the foundation is going to try and take over. And, you know, the foundation has done its best to you know, position itself that it's not doing that, but you know, you look at things like the Linux Foundation and how yeah, you know, they, it's, they it's kind of a, a shame that, that they, they called it the Linux Foundation and yeah. it's not a non profit, right? It's really the you know, yeah, that's a good Linux vendors, 
trade association. Yeah. yeah. Well, it is a trade association. Five hundred one c six. So, um, but the you know the foundation is important. It's very important. But it's also critical that it not either appear or in any way try and take over mm -hmm. what the, what goes on. And you know the problem is that you know the personalities that are at the foundation and the personalities that are in the project work together well. But I could easily see some some situation where you would get either a core elected that would be uh, antagonistic to the foundation, mm -hmm. uh, or you know, say you know we want nothing to do with them, and we're doing our own thing. Yeah, yeah. We, you're not you're not controlling us, yeah. right? Uh, you know, and and, and they could go off the rails that way. I could also see where you know core ends up being all foundation people, and you know, mm -hmm. then it's you know, we, it's it's the first time that we had someone that was both foundation and core at the same time, there was a lot of angst around that. Uh, and, you know, it seems to have worked out okay so far. But, uh, you know, that's something that requires ongoing monitoring. And yeah, I mean, because if you're not cognizant of it, that's when you get in trouble. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, it's the foundation and core are usually the people who are able to contribute the most or, or, or you know, have the both are kind of drawing from the same feedstock, so it's very hard not for them to have some overlap. Correct. Or to have enough trust from the community that they mm -hmm. say, okay, that person should be my voice or be right. my and representative in some sorts. Right. But I mean, we, you know, we have friction. Look at the code of conduct. Who mm -hmm. raw? You know, that there are certainly people that feel that that's something that the foundation imposed on the project. Not I, I'm not happen. saying that's yeah. going to happen. I'm just saying, you know, there's people that have that view. There's a lot of perception around that. Yeah. And uh, it's just, you know, this is something like that could snowball into something mm -hmm. yep. bad. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's going to be, if it happens, it's going to be some something that's going to sort of come out of left field like that. Mm -hmm. um, it requires constant work and communication with each other so that we're all on the same page mostly. Yep. So, you know, that's my fear is that, that something like that would happen going forward. But, uh, you know, I, I think that it's, I mean, Linux, all projects, all software, you know, is dominant at a period in time. You know, there was, when I was growing up, IBM just had a complete lock on the Fortune 500. You know, it, mm. you ran IBM equipment and IBM software, and no one ever got fired for buying IBM. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, <laughs> and then they, you know, it fell off their, their, their pedestal. And, you know, Microsoft. Well, and then there's the previous age kind of in between there, I think, and then the Microsoft age, and then. Right, and, you know, and Microsoft was absolutely on the top of the pile. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, they've hardly, I mean, IBM's not gone, Microsoft's right. not gone, but they're not the just total dominant thing in yeah. organizations mm -hmm. that they it's want to choice. You know, we have Google and to a lesser extent Facebook. I mean, Google is really getting into, you know, everywhere and Amazon, mm -hmm. you know, the FANG companies. Um, you know, and, and Linux is, you know, is the indomitable operating system right now, but, you know, history tells us that that won't last yeah, forever. Yeah, it's going to be. You know, They're trailing off, and right? and you know, so I like to think that you know Linux is the dinosaurs and previous is the mammals. You know, you know, <laughs> the meteor is going to hit, you know, and then the mammals will take over. But you know, I'm not even sure I really want that to happen yeah. because if we get to be the dominant one, then we're going to fall off. The yeah, yeah. So so we're always a little bit under the radar. Yeah, exactly. And, but swimming in the big pond with the other uh, yeah. folks, and yeah, and you know the. the the rumors of previous C's demise have been exaggerated, <laughs> uh, and part of that is just the amount of previous D that gets used that you know, people don't know about it yeah, right. uh, or, or know that it's there, and even to the point where the FreeBSD project isn't always aware of just how much FreeBSD is being used or in which ways it's being used. Yeah, I mean, we you know get some contribution out of left field to the foundation, and it's like. Why'd you do that? It's like, oh well, actually, we use FreeBSD stay all over the place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or you know, uh, if you have a little in-dash computer in your car and you go to the copyright screen, you scroll by. It's like I know that person and that yeah, person. Yeah. Like, 
you start seeing the names and then the copyrights like I from the list of names and the copyright for that file I can guess what file that was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or things like the PlayStation we discovered yeah. that this is running FreeBSD in, yeah. Yeah. in a certain way. So the uh, you know, we we get contributions sometimes from companies and so of course the first thing we do is ask them that you know we want to put you on our, our you know, strip of you know, users of FreeBSD and We've had a couple of them say, oh, no, 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 absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. We consider secret. the fact that we use BSD as a proprietary secret that yeah. we don't want our... I mean, it's not like they couldn't figure it out, but they don't want to, you know, yeah. promote that. <laughs> or there's others that, you know, are using it even though they, you know, promote themselves as being a Linux shop, and then, you know, they, they don't want to not be perceived as a Linux shop. Right. But nevertheless, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, so where do you see FreeBSD going in the future? Um, well, that kind of gets back to this other thing, you know, we'll be, I think it has a very strong base. I think we need, we can't just take that for granted. Right. You know, the companies, you know, companies fail or, you know, go into obscurity. You know, uh, Yahoo was, you know, our absolute poster child for a long time. Now, mm -hmm. not so much. Yeah. Uh, and that's in part because, you know, they are not a complete previous day shop anymore and mm -hmm. also because they're star is waning in the business world yeah. um, but uh, so we need to keep going out there and evangelizing and and, and bringing in new companies and new people um, but I think we're being pretty successful at that um, I think that we really need to get more into the universities yeah. which we're trying to do with some success um, I've actually been very uh, interested in, in uh, Philip Peeps you know, he travels to all these crazy conferences in Africa and Asia and other places where you would never, not normally think mm -hmm. of going. And um, there's a lot of FreeBSD that's been being used out there. And, mm -hmm. You know, he's evangelized. It kind of, uh, reminds me of you know, in the in the mid and late '90s, almost every ISP was based on FreeBSD because it was the easiest and, and cheapest way to have a, a reliable dial-up server or whatever. And then we're seeing in some of these developing countries where. You know, FreeBSD is, is the answer again, uh, and we just have to, to do the right things to capitalize on that. Yep. Uh, because, you know, places where Linux hasn't gotten into the market yet, uh, if we can just get there first, it, it means that, you know, there's not a, enough of an advantage to, to change, so if we can just... You know, if we know anything about industrial systems, is that the life cycle is like ten years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it's also the um, looking at it from an operating systems perspective, the being Unix and that it evolved over these millennia or not millennia, hopefully millennia, yeah. but over decades. these over these decades and, and years after years, and it's also the adaptability to different systems, to different environments, to different you know architectures, all that is. We got, with Unix and FreeBSD, we've been, you know, driving along that road, and it's it's been very interesting where where we've been, you know, come up with or where we or you where just here. You know, the fact that the the concept of containers was invented on FreeBSD, even yeah. though it gained its success somewhere else, mm. uh, and some of that is sometimes we have this bad habit of getting the project ninety percent of the way to the right the the great thing. And then we're missing that last little bit to, to productize it. Yeah, well, you know what they say. It's the uh, pioneers that get the arrows in the back and the settlers get the land. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've been pioneering just, way too much. Yeah. Um, but, you know, some things that I think are important if we're going to be successful in the future is we've got to get things like a container solution that's mm -hmm. like the, you know, the, the stock the productized one. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, it, and uh, running in the cloud. Mm -hmm. you know, the fact that we're on EC2. First class on EC2 and Azure yeah. and other things like that yeah. uh, is is definitely important. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, also tuning our own gun. I mean, of Android, everyone talks about. Oh, you know, Android's all Linux. Well, yes, it is Linux operating system, but nearly the entire user level on top of that is BSD because you know they 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 GNU license doesn't work for yep. contaminating things. Yep. So. You know, we're in a lot of places that uh, you know we're not well known for being in. You know, mm -hmm. I think we need to make a little more of a push to let the people know that. Yeah, but I think you're right that the, one of the areas we need to push harder on is 
the universities and so on so that uh, we get that next generation of people that are uh, get exposed to previously early enough yeah. that they're not already you know sold on Linux before they ever hear about BSD. Right. right. Well, you know, one of the beauties of, of young people is that they like to you know do something different sure. than what their parents did. Yes. Yeah. And, and at this point, their parents very, are yeah. Linux. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's also you know giving them the right engineering skills and like teaching them how to do proper debugging or any kind of skills that are helpful and not just this one area, but they can apply to many others. Well, and, and that's why I think the, the Teach BSD project for university level stuff, where it's instead of learning about the concept of computer science in a toy operating system environment, using a real operating system you can run on your real computer to do exactly. real work, uh, but being able to instrument in such a way that you can actually learn the, the concepts of uh, computer science without having too much risk of it all going wrong or there being too many side effects. Yeah, well, I mean, the toy operating system has kind of faded out, and mm -hmm. but mostly what they're, you know, learned, the, the real one they're learning is Linux. Mm -hmm. But Linux is now so huge and complex that mm -hmm. it's really hard to wrap your brain around it, whereas FreeBSD yeah, is still at a size where, mm -hmm. you, you know, I mean, at least for pieces of it, like the scheduler or, mm -hmm. you know, the M system, whatever, you can still, like, understand it. And at the same time, it's it's that much more observable, and then we have the right tools to actually be able to, you know, it's it's made out of glass, so you can watch the parts inside while they're moving. Yes. Uh, whereas you know, other machines, there this big black box over in the corner that's making a lot of noise, but you can't tell what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, things like D-Trace mm -hmm. um, are much more advanced in FreeBSD than they are in, for example, Linux. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you saw the D Watch talk today, but that was a very impressive wrapper around D Trace to yeah. just, you know, bring it to the masses. You don't have to even understand most of what D Trace is doing. You know, just like give me this this tool, and I, yeah, I can apply it to multiple areas where you haven't thought about before. That's just, this is applicable. The, the the hard question has always been coming up with the question to ask, uh, not just finding the answer. You know, we have lots of tools to find the answer. It's you have to decide what the, the question is. <laughs> right, but the, the, the problem is that, you know, D-Trace is kind of the assembly language of answering questions. All right, I've got this question, all right, well now I have to write this 100-line program. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas something like D-Watch, it's like, well, I've got this question in, you know, like 10 lines of stuff yeah. and I'm, yeah. I can get a graphical answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that also appeals to more uh, younger folks who are just, oh, you guys with your terminals, that's just black and white, and there's a cursor blinking. I want something more, you know, interesting, like colors and, you know, yeah. things flame, moving flame around. Flame graphs. And yeah, and interaction and, and things and like that. GIF animations. And, yeah. And, <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm, I'm very excited to see stuff like that, because I think that's, again, it's going to draw in a, a broader group of people. Yeah. Well then, thank you for having this interview with us and hopefully uh, see you again in the next 25 years <laughs> or hopefully sooner than that. <laughs> All right, yeah, well, five minutes, huh? no problem. <laughs> <laughs> So we hope you enjoyed this interview with Kirk McCusick and uh, this comes... Uh, not surprisingly that this is the end of our episode for this very last episode of this year. Uh, but the we want end to say of the year as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been a long year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to extend a big thank you to the entire BSD community for making the show possible. You know, all the people that contributed uh, code and changes and documentation and ports and testing and just using the BSDs are the reason why we do this show. And of course, a big thank you to all of our viewers for actually watching the show and for providing the feedback that actually makes the show successful and, and what it is. Uh, so we wish you all a happy and prosperous new year and we will see you next week. Mm -hmm.